This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. I was gonna make a joke off the top here for April Fool's Day, but I don't wanna get fined by the FCC or choke slam by my boss's boss. So, very straightforwardly, here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, Newsy and some big name partners bring you an exclusive report shedding light on a massacre of civilians in a war-torn region. We'll show you the digital detective work behind the story. Then, millions of people have left the US workforce in the last year, and the vast majority are women. What are the solutions that could help women get back to their careers? But first, here's what you need to know right now. Testimonies about George Floyd and the day he died filled the courtroom this week in the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. Uh, multiple officers on top of the patient when we pulled up at that point. Uh, we assumed, I, I should I say I assumed that there was potentially some struggle still because they were still on top of him. Footage from officers' body cameras was also made public for the first time. Please don't shoot me, please man. I'm not gonna please. shoot you. Chauvin faces three charges in Floyd's death. Much of Chauvin's defense is focusing on use of force policies for police to convince the jury his actions were justified. Prosecutors are using witnesses and video to convince the jury of the opposite. The other big argument both sides will focus on, Floyd's cause of death. Chauvin's defense argues it was caused in part by drugs in Floyd's system and pre-existing health issues. An independent autopsy hired by Floyd's family found the cause of death to be asphyxiation from sustained pressure. Floyd liked to work out every day. Um, he lifted weights that are far beyond anything I could lift every single day. After more than seven hours of debate overnight, the Texas State Senate signed off on a controversial new bill to tighten limits around voting. The bill would limit extended early voting hours, prohibit drive through voting, and make it illegal for local election officials to proactively send applications to vote by mail to voters even if they qualify. Republicans say the bill is about election security, even though there was no proof of widespread fraud found in the 2020 election. That election also happened to have some of the highest voter turnout ever. Democrats and voting rights advocates called this bill and the more than 200 others like it nationwide suppressive. Georgia faces backlash from several companies after the governor there signed a bill last week which makes it a crime to provide food or water to voters lined up outside polling stations and limits drop boxes among other things. But there are also states taking steps to loosen up limits on voting. On Wednesday, Virginia became the first state to enact its own version of the Federal Voting Rights Act meant to make voting more accessible to all citizens. This time next year, two more states will allow legal sale of recreational marijuana, but the bills do more than just let you get your smoke on. In New Mexico, legislators approved a bill to legalize weed and a bill to expunge the criminal records of people who were arrested or convicted for possessing marijuana for personal use. According to the Associated Press, at least 100 prisoners would have their sentences reconsidered under the new plan. Meanwhile, in New York, the governor approved legal recreational weed earlier this week. Under the law, 40% of the revenue from sales tax will go towards minority communities that have disproportionate numbers of weed-related arrests. While these bills legalize marijuana recreationally in New Mexico and New York, it'll probably be another year until it's actually sold there. The states now need to set up a framework and issue licenses to businesses who will sell. The internet is a big, dark place, and it can seem a little bit darker when videos surface out of a war-torn region of Africa showing a mass killing of civilians, one with very few details to actually hold anyone responsible. Enter open source journalism. It's the kind of reporting that uses satellite imagery, social media, and other digital tools to shed some light on all that darkness. Our own award-winning Newsy Bellingcat series worked with reporters from BBC's Africa Eye in hopes of bringing some accountability to the people behind this massacre. Here's Newsy's Jake Godin to explain how. Ethiopia's northern Tigray region is plunging further into a bloody months-long conflict over territory that's home to millions of people. And as it drags on, more evidence of war crimes is starting to surface. Together with investigators from BBC Africa I and Bellingcat, Newsy examined a series of videos that first showed up in early March. In them, soldiers are seen executing a group of unarmed people. By listening to and locating these videos, we can gain a better understanding of where exactly this took place and who might be responsible. Here's how. 
In early November, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or TPLF, attacked government army bases throughout the region after months of growing tension. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed responded by launching an offensive. In less than a month, the Ethiopian government and its allies took control of Mekele, Tigray's regional capital, and Prime Minister Ahmed declared the main operation of the conflict over, but the TPLF said they weren't giving up. Fights with the government and its allies on one side, and the TPLF on the other, are ongoing throughout Tigray. And there are mounting claims that war crimes are being committed, while the humanitarian situation is quickly worsening. With internet intermittent and tightly controlled by the government, the evidence for these war crimes can be challenging to come by. But in early March, a series of videos appeared on social media. What they show is graphic. A group of unarmed people are led to a cliff's edge and shot by armed soldiers. In one of the clips, bodies litter the cliffside as the soldiers fire at them to ensure that they're dead. There's no discernible information about where this occurred, but using various open source tools, we can figure out where it happened, giving some context as to who might be behind this massacre in the process. To find out where this incident took place, we have to use visual clues captured in the video. Some of the most recognizable features include the cliff's ridgeline, the mountain geography in the background, and the shadows. First, the shadows. The length and direction of these tells us that the sun was very low in the sky, either because it was rising or setting. This would mean that the ridgeline here would have to be facing either north to south or south to north. Next, the landscape. From what we can see in the videos, the terrain is distinct enough that we can tell it's most likely a plateau-like location, given the flat lines followed by the steep drop-offs. Various posts on social media claimed that the incident took place near a town called Mahaberdego, just south of Axum. The terrain surrounding the city match up with what we see in the video. And by searching around the area, we can find some terrain that starts to match up. The mountains in the background are a little bit more tricky. While Google Earth renders geography quite well, it's difficult to really make out what we're looking at in a region like this. Using another tool, Peak Visor, we can better make out the mountains in the background. With it, we can match up two mountains in the distant background, as well as a plateau seen here across the valley, captured in a few frames in one of these videos. Put it all together and we can pinpoint a very close approximation of where this incident took place, about two miles south of Mahaberdego and 10 miles south of Axum. Listening to what is being said in the videos can give us some context on who was involved. While Eritrean soldiers were accused of committing massacres in Axum in late November, we can tell that these are likely not Eritrean soldiers because they're speaking Amharic, not Tigrinya or Arabic, the primary languages of Eritrea. There's also this. The word woyane is sometimes used as a derisive way to describe people believed to be rebels or affiliated with the TPLF. For Tigrayans, because of the word's history, it has more of a respected meaning. We spoke with the International Crisis Group's William Davison, who had this to say. So it was a rallying cry for the Tigrayan struggle, um, which was also along the lines of you know, demanding uh, autonomy, or at least against marginalization by the central state. It looks very much like they are accusing those people in the video of being members of the TPLF. The, the fact that these people are suspected of being Moyane or they are being attacked as such is almost sort of seen as justification um, for the violence that's being exacted against them. There's another video that can give us even more context on who may be responsible. This video, which appeared online around the same time as the others we've looked at, shows a large group of soldiers surrounding 25 people in civilian clothing sitting on the ground. Using the same technique we did with the previous videos, we can geolocate it to a ridge line a little over a kilometer northeast from where the other videos were filmed. There's at least one clue in this video that gives us an idea of who the soldiers are here. There's this patch on one of the soldiers' arms, which resembles patches worn by other members of Ethiopia's military. 
Since this video was filmed in a different location than the others, it's hard to definitively say whether these soldiers and victims are the same as those seen in the first set of videos. But there is at least one individual who seems to be present in both this video and the other set of videos. This person, wearing a red shirt and white shawl over their head, matches another individual seen being walked at gunpoint to the cliff edge in one video. And then in another video, their body is seen lying next to the cliff's edge. The massacre captured on this video is just one of many in this conflict over Tigray. This and other massacres are enough to have sparked an investigation from the United Nations, though, and new evidence could bring an even broader international attention to this human rights crisis. Here to talk to us a little bit more about the reporting you just saw is Jake Godin. Jake, what I noticed in watching this piece is that you all stopped short of actually saying who it was that was doing the shooting that was killing these people. Uh, why was that? There's there's a lot of like data points. There's a lot of like small pieces of evidence that can kind of like lead us towards a better picture of who it was, but there's not quite enough to really give us a full picture. To really get a better idea of who exactly is responsible, it would need essentially the like a really important step of this whole process, which is on the ground reporting from people, uh, from reporters or from investigators on the ground. And it's just simply a very dangerous situation right now in Tigray. So it's kind of hard for that to happen. We know that this conflict has been going on for a bit now. Why is the UN just now launching an investigation into what's happening in this region? It's taking some time not only for the investigations to kind of go through all the evidence that exists, but also to reach out to people and try and kind of get a better idea of what's going on, especially if there's not a whole lot of visual evidence out there, then you're having to talk about reaching out to people who are either in refugee camps in Sudan or reaching out to locals who happen to have access to the internet. And I think the United Nations stuff is kind of going off of the momentum from investigations from like Amnesty International and CNN and Human Rights Watch. Ideally, they'll be able to get people on the ground who are able to investigate um, what could amount to war crimes. Jake, what are the next steps here? Well, what we're looking for is somebody, you know, more, more essentially objective entities to get on the ground and look into what happened here. That would also ideally mean that the United Nations could have an easier time delivering aid to people in the region as well, um, instead of being kind of hampered by how dangerous and how volatile the situation is. Jake Godin, thank you very much. Thank you. When you're back, we'll hit the Sonic the Hedgehog spin dash and zip through tech and gaming headlines. Y'all, earlier this week, I thought I was gonna have to pour one out for a real one. And by real one, I mean the only plumber I've had a serious and intimate relationship with. We're diving into the world of magic mushrooms and gaming with one of our favorite segments, Next Level Speed Run, starting with this. Contrary to what you might read on the interwebs, no Nintendo gaming icon Mario is still alive and well, but a few of his old games did get yanked from retailers. Some context. To celebrate Mario's 35th anniversary, Nintendo re-released several old titles featuring the plumber last year, but the company only planned to sell those games until March 31st, yesterday, before removing them from digital and retail stores. The company apparently hoped a limited time offer would boost sales, but it's also generated a lot of tongue-in-cheek speculation about Mario's well-being. So if Nintendo could send us a proof of life video for Mario, I would feel a lot better about this. Microsoft just scored a military contract worth up to $21.8 billion thanks to its augmented reality tech. The US Army is asking Microsoft to make 120,000 AR headsets for its troops. The headsets would be based on Microsoft's HoloLens project, which lets users project virtual images onto the real world. Microsoft is making bank off its relationship with the DoD. In 2019, it won a $10 billion contract to provide cloud services for the military, though Amazon's still contesting that decision in court. 
Cyberpunk 2077 is a one-player game first and foremost, but a promised multiplayer mode has apparently been put on ice. Game developer CD Projekt Red says it's reconsidered its original plan to release a multiplayer version of Cyberpunk 2077. This comes after some restructuring at the studio following the game's botched rollout last year. The developers are still working to fix the glitchy title. A recent patch listed hundreds of bug fixes or improvements to the base game. The pandemic has, and still is, hurting American labor. Unemployment peaked back in April of 2020 at 14.8%, which was the highest level since the Great Depression. Many workers in the U.S. have bounced back, but women in the workforce were disproportionately impacted. News' Bianca Faschini tells us about gender-specific recovery efforts to get women back to work. From nanny to teacher and nurse, women have taken on lots of additional roles during the pandemic, and it's having a devastating effect on their careers. It just was impossible, quite impossible um, to manage. Before COVID, Tasneem Buyan worked as a certified nursing assistant in Michigan, where she lived with her husband and twin girls. But all of that changed quickly. We just packed up and we came to Texas because my whole extended family is here. She gave up her job like millions of other women and became a stay-at-home mom. By early 2020, women were a majority of the workforce. But a year into the pandemic, much of those gains have been erased. Almost a million mothers left the workforce last year, and economists are sounding the alarm. What we have seen in this downturn has been unprecedented. Women are still struggling to find balance despite all the relief bills passed in Washington. That's why some lawmakers are calling for gender-specific measures. Congresswoman Grace Meng introduced the Marshall Plan for Moms. Named after the financial assistance the U.S. provided to Europe after World War II, it would offer several benefits, like paid leave and affordable child care, to women who left their jobs during COVID to care for kids. This is uh, one of the most important investments that we can make in our country. There is some global precedent for this. Across Europe, several countries have provided cash payments to women amid the pandemic. The bill was inspired by a petition that, among other measures, calls for direct payments to moms. But not everyone is on board with that part. The answer is not to pay mom for doing what's falling on her shoulders. The answer is to change the division of labor. The proposal, introduced in February, has an uncertain path ahead in Congress, considering the $15 minimum wage measure that many Republicans are opposed to. And women have still lost more than 5 million jobs since February 2020. Experts point out that many of the issues women face now existed before and were simply exacerbated by the pandemic. There is some room for optimism, though. A vaccine rollout, stimulus bills that boosted child tax credits, and President Biden's infrastructure proposal that includes child care aid. I am optimistic that, that we will quickly be able to unwind from the, the problems that were, that were put in place just because of the pandemic that we are hopefully now on the road to emerging from. Bianca Fischini, Newsy, Washington. Some former D1 athletes are taking their talents to the highest court to fight for education-related payments for student athletes. Supreme Court justices, they're just like us. They too have spent a bit of time talking about the NCAA during their nine to five. Unlike us, they heard oral arguments in a case that deals with compensation for NCAA athletes and whether that could blur the line between amateur and professional athletics. Newsy's Austin Kim takes a closer look at the NCAA's restrictions on compensating students who are also athletes and how the Supreme Court could change that. A win on the hardwood is sweet, but victory in the Supreme Court could be transformative. A case called NCAA v. Alston looks at whether the NCAA can limit educational benefits for athletes. Well, this case is a fundamental challenge to the very model of the NCAA as we've known it for the last 100 years. Former West Virginia running back Sean Alston and former University of California center Justine Hartman are leading the class action suit. This isn't about college athletes getting salaries. They're arguing the NCAA cannot limit education-related benefits. 
The two want the Supreme Court to uphold a lower court ruling so schools could pay for computers or science equipment or allow athletes to get paid internships. But the NCAA worries universities could abuse the new rules, allowing wealthy donors to fuel bidding wars for players. These would be, you know, provision of in-kind benefits over and above full cost of attendance scholarships in actual necessary and reasonable educational expenses. And the NCAA's argument is that, well, then this is really becoming a type of pay for play. During oral arguments, justices voiced their concern over the NCAA's amateurism argument. It does seem that schools are conspiring with competitors to pay no salaries to the workers who are making the schools billions of dollars on the theory that consumers want the schools to pay their workers nothing. But they worry about the high court's involvement and future litigation that could extend those benefits and blur the lines between professional and amateur sports. I worry a lot about judges getting into the business of deciding how uh, amateur sports should be run. And I can think of ways around that. This Supreme Court case is separate from a discussion in Congress about whether college athletes can make money off their name, image, and likeness. But together, they are part of a broader discussion about college athletes' rights. There are some pretty significant changes that are coming to college sports, and we will probably uh, start to see them uh, with the next academic year in the fall. What will be the uh, institution that's driving the change? The NCAA has had multiple opportunities to do so and has chosen, you know, effectively not to do so, there will be change. It's just a question of who is going to be the driving force. For Newsy, I'm Austin Kim. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy and the Loop. If you're feeling really bold, let me know how you're legally celebrating April Fool's Day, legally. I don't want y'all snitching on yourselves. There's a pretty big question out there for the nearly 55 million people in the US who've been fully vaccinated and others who are on deck. How long are you covered after being inoculated? National reporter Maya Rodriguez takes a look at one test that could provide some answers by checking your antibodies months after you're fully vaccinated. More than 50 million people in the country are now fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Most of America is already speeding towards normalcy. But one question is emerging. How long will the vaccines remain effective in protecting the human body against the coronavirus? It's obviously a new virus here on the planet, and relatively speaking, and, and I don't think people know everything about it yet. John Hugh Muller is with Axim Biotechnologies, a company that just developed Immunopass, a new test now undergoing FDA emergency approval. It determines how many neutralizing antibodies a person has against COVID-19. The end point of all vaccines is to create as many neutralizing antibodies. So these neutralizing antibodies will actually attach to the spike protein uh, uh, on the virus. And that stops the virus from then attaching to your ACE2 protein in your body, which is how it gets into your body to, to begin with. But over time, those neutralizing antibodies begin to diminish. When a booster shot might be needed is unclear. Immunopass checks antibody levels in a few drops of blood within 10 minutes. Everybody is different in whether or not, you know, the, the vaccine will last for six months, nine months, a year. Nobody knows at this point because um, it's too early. But with our test, you're actually able to monitor your neutralizing antibodies. Testing for those neutralizing antibodies will become critical across the globe as more people get vaccinated because experts say COVID-19 is likely to circulate around the world for years to come. If approved, the test would first be administered by medical professionals before potentially moving to over the counter. This virus is gonna stick around, which you know a lot of people think it's gonna be here for the rest of our lives. And you do need that annual shot, kind of like the flu shot then we hope to be able to have the test that can tell you when that is. Because again, everybody's different. But all facing the same COVID threat. I'm Maya Rodriguez reporting. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week for more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.